Welcome to the second episode of our new Gearing Up series, where we chat with unsung heroes or people we feel you need to be aware of and who should get your attention. Our regular series continues and you can go ahead and listen to our interviews with the likes of David Coulthard, Crofty, Sebastian Buemi, Brendan Harley, Karun Chandok, Mark Blundell and many more. First up on Gearing Up, we had Todd McCandless, the biggest F1 podcaster you've probably never heard of, but certainly should. On this show, we've got someone you probably have heard of, but before we introduce him, I have to head east to Essex, home of the second longest coastline of any English county and also England's smallest town, Manningtree. However, Essex is best known for being home to the illustrious co-host, Harry Benjamin. How are you? I'm very well, thank you, Tim. Thank you again for the lovely introduction. I feel like you might have used up all your Essex facts, and I think you're reusing yeah. some now. Um, <laughs> I'm doing all right. Back in the uh, back in the cupboard, in the recording cupboard, uh, in my loft, but uh, doing all right. Um, but you know, you have we got a baby yet or not? No baby yet. I'm still no baby waiting. Yet. Um, um, we keep organising these podcasts and recordings at different times. This one in the UK where we are now is about eight o'clock in the evening. We've got some more booked in for Wednesday and due date is, is what day is it today? Thursday. Due yeah. date is tomorrow. The baby's due tomorrow. Wow. So, um, or is it Saturday? It's either tomorrow or Saturday. I'm not sure. So anytime <laughs> from now, it could be a disaster. <laughs> but anyway, we'll plow on and deal with that situation when it comes. Um, shall I introduce today's guest? Absolutely. Let's do it. So, ladies and gents, Willie T. Ribs is a former American racing driver. He was the first African-American to test a Formula One car and made history when he successfully navigated the month of May to reach one of the most important races in the world, the Indy 500, on a shoestring budget. The Defiance star dominated series, including Trans Am, IMSA and others, and has even competed in the UK, where he showed pace that surpassed drivers who went on to not only compete in, but win in Formula One. It's our pleasure to have him dialing in all the way from the USA. Willie, welcome to the Motormouth podcast. What's going on, players? <laughs> Willie, absolute pleasure and honour to have you on the podcast. Thank you for uh, agreeing to come on. Um, now, I know we chat a little bit just off air now, but tell us what lockdown life is like where you are. You're in Texas, aren't you? Yeah, but I'm, you know, Texas is a big state. And uh, I live out in the country, and I like being out in the country. And uh, there, there's, uh, we don't have to wear a mask. We don't have to wear clothes out here. Okay, <laughs> I mean, I walk to the, I walk to the mailbox buck naked, and and the squirrels and the deer, you know, are, are, are those lucky know, they're, squirrels. They're checking one it with out. nature. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. That's nice. Oh, so you're not a, you're not a city boy then. You prefer being out in the sticks. Oh yeah. I grew up in it. Uh, on my grandfather's ranch and uh, you know once my racing career came to uh, a slowdown uh, I'm back on it again yeah very nice amazing too. now of course uh, we've all seen your documentary that's out on Netflix in the UK and across across the globe as well Uppity um, let's let's talk about that to begin with that uh, we can see you there with the uh, the Uppity cap on as well doing the and uh, making sure the promo is going getting spot on um, <laughs> first of all brilliant documentary if anybody who's listening to this hasn't seen it go and watch it immediately it is brilliant emotional and it you know even if you're not into racing the story is incredible how was it for you when you know when did they come to you with this idea or was it your idea how did it all come about the producer adam carolla he had initially did a film on paul newman it was called the racing life of paul newman and this was five years ago and uh he interviewed me. Uh, they came to the ranch. They interviewed me about my relationship with Newman. He was very important in my career, almost uh, one of the most important. And mm -hmm. uh, after the film was done, he called me back and he says, I'm getting a lot of response to your interviews. And we would like to do a story on you. I said, on one condition that um, we don't pull any punches. I said, there's going to be, uh, it's going to be the good, the bad, and the ugly. There's going to be some people that are butt hurt, but as my grandpa used to say, that's why you got a butt. You're going to get it hurt sometime. <laughs> Yeah, I think you do. It does an amazing job as well at telling your story. Because I suppose, was there always a bit of a fear that, you know, it might not, uh, it might not convey what you wanted to? You were pretty happy with the outcome of it all. Oh, yeah. No, yeah. I, and, and I'm going to tell you, when I went to the editing room, when it was done, 
It was done right before um, Adam Carolla's Christmas party. And uh, my wife and I flew down to LA to Hollywood. He took us, you know, and had this party at his studio. So he took us into his screening room and he says, I'm, I'm going to put you two in here. Here's the couch. I'm closing the door. No one's coming in. And when it was done, I and I and I was prepared to be disappointed. I was. And when I when it was over, my wife, people thought my wife and I had an argument because she came out of the room crying. And uh, and and she was it was uh, it was un it was hard to imagine that they could create because there was material in there that I didn't know existed. Wow. And how they put the narratives together, the, the storyline, uh, and the interviews, including the king himself, Bernie Ecclestone. Um, it, you know, it, it was just brilliant. Uh, yeah. Brilliant. All of it. And there was some, it's a very highly charged and an emotional show. It must have been, in a way, I guess, therapeutic for you to talk it through like that in such depth. And there are moments in the documentary where you do get emotional and, and, um, you know, there are people close to you that you've lost over the years and, and that that feeling of, of loss comes across really well. What was it like reliving all this stuff and going back over your memories? You, you know, you'd be surprised um, how much you can remember without being waterboarded. Um, you know, uh, it, it all starts to come back and you know with with some visuals which i had in front of me to be able to tell the story to recollect uh and it was the good the bad and the ugly i mean it was that was the film and i um uh you know the the emotional parts you know they they it was almost opening up uh a little wound yeah. that was there yeah. And, and how's the response been from those that have featured in the documentary? Have you heard from people that you haven't heard from for many years with their thoughts of support or, or negative responses even? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's been the response worldwide has been phenomenal. And the individuals that were in it, they told a story and they had the they had the cojones you know, I don't know what that means, what they, how they interpret that in, in England. Same way. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Same works. way, okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, they told it like it was. And, and they didn't bite their lip. And that's what gave impact mm. uh, to it. Uh, they knew what was going on. And they told it like it was. And they were happy. Amazing. Well, it, it, it really is a brilliant documentary. And I'm sure we will come back in and talk about it throughout uh, the show. But let's let's talk about um, the very beginning for you and, you know, growing up and and that passion for racing cars. When did that first happen? You know, when when did the racing bug bite you and you go, yeah, I know I want to be a, a motor racing driver? Well, I mean, I was going to the races with my dad at three years old because my dad was actually racing. Uh, when I was born, he had started on motorcycles. He was racing dirt track. And his buddy, who he grew up with by the name of Joe Leonard, was a national motorcycle champion. Well, then eventually Joe Leonard went on to race cars. And then my dad was getting on in age. You know, but, you know, after you're about 25, 26 years old, it's time to get off those two wheels and get on four, right? Because, <laughs> yeah, the, the rash, you know, all that rash all over your body. Yeah. So, Not pleasant. <laughs> yeah. So he uh, went on to cars and, and I was traveling to the races with him at a very early age. And I knew at nine years old what my goal was. I knew this is what I want to do. I didn't want to work in the family business because I had an option. I mean, I didn't have to go to school even. I mean, I could have just quit school and worked in the family business. I didn't want to do that. I mean, uh, uh, especially working for my dad. I know I could work for my grandpa, but I couldn't work for you know, my dad. And um, so I um, got my racing license, you know, when I got out of high school and I headed for England. And I knew, and I, and I followed 
uh, all the uh, my my dad's friends were all race drivers, mm -hmm. which included Dan Gurney and Phil Hill. He knew uh, all the drivers that were legends at that time. So my career path mainly. I came to England because Emerson Fittipaldi did. I knew that he left Brazil for a reason, and I read his story. He came to England because he wanted to be in Formula One, and that was the reason uh, I wanted to go to England to and, and add, when, be in Formula One. When you came over to our shores, and um, you're still relatively young at this stage. What was going through your head? Was it, did it feel like a massive move? Where did you live? What did you do? How did you, you know, make money? Did, did you get immersed in the, in, the, in the culture here? What was it like? It was like going to another planet. I mean, I tell people when I left the United States, I'd never been to England. I lived in Harold Wood, ex Essex. Oh, hey. Harry's part of the world. Yeah. Right. It was uh, sort of a spinoff from Harold Hill. It was like a suburb of a place called Harold Hill. And Harold Wood was a really nice place. It was close to the uh, train station there, so I could go in and out of London. And I was learning my way around uh, Harold Wood. And, uh, and after a while, you know, the neighborhood knew there was... Uh, a yank in town and he was colored he was colored <laughs> and so so you know i used to uh go to a pub called spencer's arms there which was walking distance from my it was i lived in a one room flat one room that's all i had the money for and my parents were sending me money to race for uh a, 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 a team called scorpion racing and it was owned by a gentleman named Mike Eastick. And Scorpion brought a lot of drivers along. I mean, they, they were quite well known uh, for bringing up drivers. And um, I went out to his farm near Snetterton. That's where his farm was near. And uh, I told him I wanted to drive, uh, rent his race car. And when I first got to his ranch, um, he thought I was there to, to work on a farm. And I said, well, you know, I'm not, I'm not a farm worker. I, I came here to drive cars. And so he put me in a test and we did a test at Snetterton. And then first race was Mallory Park. I finished third. The second race was Snetterton and I won. And I knew right then uh, I, I think I could get the job done. Yeah, because it, it's the, the the UK scene at F four F three level is still hugely competitive. If you can win at that level in the UK, you know you've got something. Have you been back to Snetterton and those tracks since? Have you have you come back over here? I'm there every other year uh, right. in England, and the reason I'm there is my son Theo is one of the top clay shooters in the world. So he comes uh, to uh, High Wycombe yep. every year uh, and competes at E.J. Churchill uh, shooting grounds. And um, I found out when I, you know, and I, I know everyone at E.J. Churchill, found out that Bernie Ecclestone's wife shoots there. Bernie's so, wife is a clay shooter. She shoots at E.J. Churchill, Ross Braun who's a good friend of mine, shoots at E.J. Churchill. So, uh, yeah, I'm in England, and it's great because I get to come back and see uh, Akram Sami, who uh, yep. has been at McLaren. Um, Akram Sami was my partying buddy when I lived in England. This was 1977, 79. Wow. That's so yeah. cool. So, e Ekram is, uh, he's a legend on the, the commercial side of motorsport. I mean, you know, he, he's... He's up there. He's as good as it gets. Oh, yeah. No, we were, and we were both young then. And even then, Sami was, I mean, he could, he could sell ice to Eskimos. I mean, he, he, he just had that look and still does. Yeah. He still does. Uh, he could do his own, he could do his own talk show. <laughs> God, that's amazing. I didn't realize you came over so much. That's brilliant. Well, that's good news because we must meet up and we can take you for a beer down our local pub. We'll take you back to Essex.
<laughs> Not to us. Oh yeah, no, I'd love, I'd love to get back and and go to the pub again and walk in there. I mean, I, I had two or three fist fights in there when I was, <laughs> when, I, when I lived there. They, they thought I was Jamaican. Yeah, but you're, I you're... In there, man. yeah, yeah. I walked in there one day at a New Year's party, <laughs> and they what? Hey, well, what are you doing? I said, what the oh. hell? <laughs> I Willie, you're funny. you're quite you're quite handy with your fists, aren't you? you oh yeah, you can, you can hold your own. Funny, you know. And and I said, what the hell is that? <laughs> then, then so the guy told me. I said, well, we use the N word back in the United States. Wow. Bang. <laughs> Do you well, follow? Sorry, Not Harry. Him. He's got me on boxing now. This is this is game over. Um, <laughs> do you follow the the heavyweight boxing scene now? A little bit, you know. I I got a lot of friends in the industry. Uh, you know, Ali was my mentor, and everyone, yeah. the whole yeah. world knows about my Muhammad Ali and my relationship, and you know, me going to Brixton with him one day, and um, and Ray Leonard and I are very good friends. Sugar Ray. Yeah, Mike Tyson. Mike, Mike took me to a party one night in Cleveland. That was crazy. So I mean, the boxing stories. And I trained with Leonard. I trained with Larry Holmes. I trained with Ray Mercer, John the Beast Mugabe, and and they were all like, they were wow. all like, teach us how to drive our fast cars, and and we'll teach you some boxing tricks. So cool. Did and they? You, sorry. Right. I was going to say, did Muhammad Ali, what, what's, you know, he must have given you so many, uh, he must have said so many things. Was he, was he there giving you advice as well? Is there anything that stuck with you over the years? No, more just, you know, you got to be, be a man. Don't, don't ever let him see you cry. He, he was very hard about be it, not showing weakness. And that was, that was invaluable. Yeah. He said, because, you know, you, he knew what the oppositions I was going to deal with. He knew it. He came from Louisville, Kentucky. That's the Confederacy down there. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And you adopted his, uh, his, his shuffle, of course, when you uh, uh, you'd get your victory, go on to the guitar and do the Ali shuffle. Well, I want to see, I want to see Lewis do it. I know that Formula One knows a little narrow. But I want to see Lewis, you know, he gets up on the car, right? All right, but I, I want you to, uh, you know, uh, get them uh, shoes uh, so they'll slide easy on that nose. It's a bit dangerous. There's not, there's not enough, uh, sir, there's not as much surface area to do that on. One false move and he's off. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, no, you better be good, Frank Sinatra. <laughs> oh, dear. oh, brilliant. Well, Willie, that's... In your F3 days, Willie, did, who were you uh, competing against in the UK? What were some of the names that you were, you were racing against and beating? I didn't race Formula 3. I raced Formula Ford in okay. the Formula 4 championship. Now, that's where Nigel Mansell and I, in my fourth race, I think it was, the race that Bernie Ecclestone and Gordon Murray came, they actually came to see me. Oh, right. They came out. I was stunned. And they walked, I was, I was walking down the pit lane and they walked up to me and they said, um, uh, I'm Bernie. I said, I, yes, sir. I know Mr. Eccleston who you are. And I knew Gordon. And so they said to me, um, we've been watching you and, uh, and keep up the good work. And I just thought that's it. I, I, my reasoning, reasoning for coming to England, was just answered, right? And that same race, Nigel was there racing. Well, I didn't meet Nigel Mansell until we were on the lorry going around the racetrack uh, with the victory uh, wreaths on our neck. The race was over. Uh, Michael Rowe won it from Ireland. I was second. Nigel was third. And we got up on the podium, we shook hands, and then we got down, walked down the steps. This was a Brands Hatch. We got in the lorry on the back of it where you could stand up and go around the track and wave to the crowd like the queen, you know, how you move your hand like that? Yeah. yeah. So I didn't know how to do that, right? I, I, you know, I was just, you know, how you doing, <laughs> right? Well, you know, 
then I'm watching the, you know, Nigel, you know, he could do it pretty damn good. Right. You know, so, um, um, on that lorry is where Nigel and I formally introduced ourselves and started talking. And that, that, um, I remember it like it was yesterday and I, and Mansell then as now was a bad cat. <laughs> oh, he, he was a bad cat. I mean, we, him and I went at it. Right. And, uh, we both could see each other's numbers a lot. Mm -hmm. Because that's how sideways we were. I mean, we were going through. We were going through the first corner. I forget the name of that corner. Uh, it Brands Hatch, and you go yep. over the hill. Down to we the right. could look. Yeah, we could look at each, look to the side, and see each other's numbers. That's how cross we were. Oh, it was. Wow. It was. A, yeah, yeah. How, how cool is that track? When you, that, going down, to, doing that first right hand bend down up the hill shot right back down again it's such a cool race circuit did you enjoy racing there oh yeah yeah no it was but it was legendary it's a legendary uh racetrack where mm. the greatest drivers uh competed on and as a young driver that's that's what you live for you live for uh being where the uh, where the legends were so, so what were your, your next steps? You're, you're racing in Formula Ford. You're, you know, you're beating the likes of Nigel Mansell. You've got Bernie Eccleston saying, hi, we can see you. We like what we're seeing. Keep it up. What are you thinking? And, and what's, what's next? What happens next? Because you only got so far in the UK before having to go back to America. I ran out of money. Yeah. And my parents, you know, were, were paying the bills. And... Um, they said, well, you know, we got, uh, you got some sisters and brothers we got to put through college. And so, you know, they, they are watching how much money we're giving you. So you, you're going to have to come home. they're not happy. Yeah, yeah, you're going to have to come home. You know, I know you, I know you think you're the golden boy, uh, but uh, you're going to have to uh, saddle up that horse and get back to uh, the United States. Mm. So uh, I came home and I, uh, got uh, an opportunity to do some open Formula Atlantic races in the United States in the early 80s. It was actually my first race was 1978. And then I went back to Long Beach in 1982. And uh, 82, when I qualified on the pole, there uh, was a big deal. That's when... Uh, you know, and there were some great drivers in that race. Jeff Brabham, Jeff Brabham, Alan Sir Jr., Roberto Moreno, Michael Andretti. There were some real young, uh, tough cats. And um, then right, at, uh, I was leading the race and we had an engine failure. But <clears throat> the message was sent. And then I got a phone call from Paul Newman later on that year to, to, put me in a Trans Am car and which made me a paid race driver. And that, that transition from single seat to single formula, uh, sorry, single seat to cars into these huge Trans Am cars, big bag cars, big tires, very powerful. How did you cope with that transition? Did it just come to you? <sighs> the best parallel I can use, it, it was, it's like dancing with a woman, a slow dance, right? Who, uh, who's like Twiggy, and then dancing with, you know, uh, Oprah, for example. Oh, yeah. Yeah, bigger, right? More bigger. full. Yeah, yeah. she's not, yeah, she's you not got, that big anymore. So you, you've got to go kind of. Yeah, yeah. You know, someone, someone. yeah. Ro Roseanne <laughs> Barr, Roseanne Barr, you know, I you mean, go. some, you got some girth there. That, yeah, that's the word. We got some girth. Well, you know, with that the woman, you know, Twiggy. I mean, you can move her around real easy. Yeah, nimble. Uh, big girl. I never thought. I never thought we'd ever get Twiggy and Oprah in the same sentence on this podcast when we first it started. It never it, thought that would ever come up. But there you works. go. <laughs> <laughs> oh so, yeah, no, you just a different, a different way you deal with the car. Mm. Uh, that's that's all. 
But, you know, you, I've seen great drivers over the years, and Mario Andretti is one of them. Bobby Unser is another one. Mm. Uh, 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 Jim Clark. Those guys could jump into any car and go fast, whether it was on the dirt, whether it was a stock car, whether it was a Formula One, whether it was an Indy car. Their versatility was was what I wanted to be able to do. And uh, and it didn't take long for me to adapt to a car that was uh, over twice as heavy as an open wheel car. Big yeah. old beast. Big old mm. beast. And, and you were up against David Hobbs at this stage. Mm. And that was quite a, how do we put it, tasty relationship that you had together. <laughs> Good old David. I mean, he, I, I, I sort of feel for him because, it, you know, he was told he was going to be the uh, big man on campus, right? He was lead, lead sled dog. Well, you know what they say about sled dogs. You know, everything behind that lead sled dog, they all look the same, right? So, right. Uh, so, uh, I I wasn't prepared to be number two and I was fast and I was faster than David. And I don't think David expected that, nor the team. And uh, especially me transitioning from a formal Atlantic car, which is rear engine and m less than a thousand pounds to a front engine car with big tires that had uh, 700 horsepower that weighed 2,800 pounds. They didn't expect that. And, and why then was that favoritism there? Was it because of the color of your skin you were not favored? No, I wouldn't say that as much as Hobbs's name. Right. You know, Hobbs was a renowned race driver, right? From Formula One, from a sports car. I mean, he had a big name and they were hiring him for his big name, mm. and uh, and I was to be uh, the junior. You know, I was to be the new kid who was going to be groomed. Well, actually, I was doing the grooming. Yeah. All right, and that that was that was hard. That was some uh, that was some tough steak and kidney to swallow. <laughs> and you got rookie of the year right that year yeah, yeah. I did. I, in fact i won more races he won four races and i won five i just happened to have some mechanical failures yeah you 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 see, you've had some bad luck with engines i think it's fair to say and we'll come on to that more later with your mm. your indy 500 exploits uh, so just skipping forward a little bit 1984 ish you move across to uh corvette tell us a bit about that period um, and, um, and I think we're creeping towards the time that you met a, a certain Don King. Well, in 84, uh, I raced for Diatley in, uh, 1983, was rookie of the year in Trans Am, Budweiser, uh, Camaros. At the end of the year, uh, after Las Vegas, we sat down the next day. They said Chevrolet wants us to go to Corvette and we're going to the Corvette, uh, platform and it's going to be different geometry is going to be different all this and so i said no problem and i said am i going to be number two to hobbs they said no i said okay we, uh, level playing field right right all right so we go to the first race um i think i had qualified on the front row i was a second and it was a guy I got into altercation with. I think he might have been on the pole. Hobbs was, I think, third. Anyway, in warm-up, Sunday morning warm-up, I come out of the pits, and as I come out of the pits, the guy I had an altercation with, who was on the pole, goes by me, boom, right, and disappears. Well, halfway around the track, he's going, crawl, he's going very slow, like, waiting for me slow right so we get up and i pull next to him and we get onto the back straight and he drag races me down the back straight at road atlanta and that's a long back straight and you drop downhill into a 180 mile per hour dog leg and he sort of eased me off 
right? Leads me off into the grass. And uh, so I followed him into the pits and um, I got out of the car and I ran down to, to talk with him. And before to, I to could talk, talk with, with him, him or to, to maybe do something else? I, I, I wanted to hit, tap him on the helmet first just so he could get, I could get his attention. And I tapped him, you know, I gave him the old uh, head slap. And um, when I got back to my pit, my, uh, the, the team manager who did not like me uh, fired me. Right then and there? Right then. I, I, oh. uh, as I was talking to him, they were covering my car up. He says, you're gone. So, and I knew they wanted to get rid of me. I, so I knew the excuse. Yeah, that, that was their out. So um, I, I packed up my stuff. I headed for the airport in Atlanta. By the time I got home, the phone was on meltdown. It was, it was just ringing off the hook. It was the media. They were calling. And then uh, Monday morning, I got a call from Detroit. And it was Michael Cranefuss, the head of SVO. And Michael Cranefuss is German, right? And he runs their racing program. And he said, and he, and I knew him already, right? And he ran Ford, and Ford wanted to beat Chevy. So he says, really, we always knew there was going to be a problem with you and your team manager. And I have Etzel Ford on the line now to tell you what we would like to do. It's and a very so, good impression. Yeah. And so, you know, they said, um, Etzel said, look, um, we want to beat Chevrolet and we know you can do it. We will build you, we'll put you with Jack Roush Racing. We will take one of our spons one of our companies, Motorcraft, which Ford owned, and we will support uh, that car, your car, and um, and it's going to take a few. Uh, it's going to take a few weeks to build it, but we want you as our driver. I was hired on Monday. I was hired. I was on a plane to Detroit on Tuesday, and 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 not only that, they paid me twice the money the athlete did. Winning. <laughs> oh yeah, well, winning a life. But this was the kicker. The, the first race was Detroit. I ended up finishing third. The second race was Daytona. I won it. And the third race was Minnesota. I won that. Well, after a rumor was put out that I intentionally got fired that, uh, so Ford could hire me. That I, I set the whole thing up. Me and Ford. Right. It was a conspiracy. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, I, and I was getting calls from the media. Word is, wow. word has it that you uh, uh, got intentionally fired so Ford could hire you. And, and a deal was already done before the first punch. <laughs> <laughs> well done, you. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> So, so you you you've got this, uh, you know, you're with the Ford, you're with Ford, and, it, and it's it's going great and that kind of thing. Let's let's talk about we've touched on him briefly, Don King. Let's talk about him legend and Don King. Uh, he's you know absolute legend, of course. For, for people who are somehow not familiar, of course, a massive promoter in in the, in the boxing world. Um, talk about your let's talk about how that relationship started and and I suppose the the early beginnings of the road to the Indy Five Hundred. Well, uh, and I'll get into this, the amazing story, the, the meeting between Don King and Bernie Ecclestone was a movie, uh, the, it, 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 that was a movie in itself. I get a, it was 1980, um, 1984, in mm -hmm. the last race of the year, Caesar's Palace, uh, Las Vegas, and, and that race was uh, in conjunction with I think IndyCar at the time, Formula One had just left because mm -hmm. Formula One had been there prior. Yeah. So uh, the race is over, I get out of the car. Well, there's not many black guys running around the pits, right? Not in a suit, right? So I, I'm, I'm 
pulling off my helmet and I'm talking to the team. And as I'm walking away back to my pit, this guy comes up to me and he says, hi, my name is so-and-so and I work for Don King. And uh, he would like to meet you. I said, when? He, tonight. So he's, okay. at the, <laughs> he's, at, he's at the Riviera and, and he would like you to, he had a fight going on. It was Bone Crusher Smith and uh, Larry Holmes, I think it was. And um, so I said, uh, I'll be there. He said, come to his office. He'd like to see his office at, at about six o'clock. So I went back to my room, got Jane went into the office and I walked into his office and he's rocking back on the chair like this, right? With that, and his hair was up in the air and he had a cigar and he was smoking a cigar and he had, you know, his, all his, uh, you know, colleagues around him and under, and, you know, ushers. And I walk in, he, Willie D, that's how I talk. Willie D, Willie D, <laughs> sit down. <laughs> you be the Muhammad Ali of racing. And so he went right into it. And <clears throat> he said he wanted to, um, he wanted to represent me. And he says, I'd like, he said, he said, what do you want to do? And so I told him I wanted to be uh, F1. I want to be in Formula One, if not Indy 500. So we, he said, great. I spent maybe <clears throat> half an hour with him. He said, here's the ticket to the fight. <clears throat> he said, you got a girlfriend with you? I said, well, my, my wife's here. He says, well, um, here's two tickets to the fight. So I did that and then went to the fight and went to the after party and all that. And then, uh, we started getting in contract with each other. And that was, that was the craziest, that was the craziest um, contract negotiation ever, ever. Mm -hmm. It was, it was, I see how he could get people to fighters to sign. Cause most of these guys were so, he couldn't read, you know, they, and that's not their fault. You know, they were fighters, you know, they started fighting early. They didn't understand anything. Well, I did. I come from a family, a business family. So, you know, after we, you know, went back and forth for uh, months, nearly almost two months, we finally got the contract looking pretty decent. And, uh, you know, we, um, we, we got it signed. And, uh, but his lawyer was dead set against it. His lawyer did not like, because it, Don ended up saying, we went back and forth so many times. Don said, okay, you guys put, uh, write the contract the way you want to write. And so we wrote it. It was fair. And, um, and Don's lawyer looked at this and went to a certain page. He went to a particular page. He said, can I say this? Can I say what it. he said? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Fuck these niggas, Don. And I, and he threw the contract on the floor. And my attorney is very pale and very redheaded. So I looked over at him and I said, you ever been called a naked? <laughs> <laughs> that went and, yeah, and, and so he, he was like red faced, right? Yeah. And, and um, so anyway, we got through, we, 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 I, I said to Don, I said, Don, I said, look, uh, this is it. I'm going to sign it. This contract, we're not going to go, you know, we, we've done this. We've done all the, the talking we're going to do. And so he said, all right. I said, well, no guts, no glory, Don. I said, you got it. I said, you got everything to gain. And so we signed it and that was it. Yeah. And he uh, went and he did a hell of a job. I mean, he, Don could snap his fingers and get money. Yep. And he was brilliant. I only know one other guy can do that. And that's F Bernie. Bernie. Uh, Bernie. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Don, Don did, did the job for you. He, he got you essentially to the Indy 500 and just skipping ahead to that. Um, the, whether it was too early, not the right time, not the right money, not the right preparation, um, a rushed project, poor relationship with the, the, the team mechanic, a dangerous car. You decided 
I can't do this. I'm gonna. I, I'm not gonna race. And then the well, press I, really went. I, I had it. gotten. Yeah, I, I, I knew, and it wasn't Don's fault. Don no. didn't know. All Don knew how to do was get money. Mm. Right. He got the money, and but the the crew chief there uh, was, in my opinion, a card carrying member. And when you say card carrying member in America, that means one thing. Okay. KKK, right? Wow. It's a, meta, it's a metaphor. He might yeah. not be KKK. However, um, I, I, he made it clear that I wasn't one, the, the driver he wanted, right? Even though he was getting paid to do it. Mm. So I... But how, how did that sit with you? Were you just like, right, I'm here, I'm just going to get on with it? Or, or how do you deal with something like that? Yeah, uh, Indy is a racetrack you do not, uh, play games with mm. okay indy will kill you and 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 a lot of drivers have died there other uh, indy with the exception of the isle of man is the most dangerous racetrack on the planet isle of man is numero uno That's mm. okay and uh indy's right behind that uh it's second and you you have to have the right people with you Okay, maybe you don't die there, but you can ruin your career there. And so I, I, it wasn't the right group, and I was advised to step away from it, and I did. I did. And uh, I had no second thoughts about doing it. But you, you got to, when you go there, you got to not only do a lot of testing, which I didn't do, I did no, no testing. You've got to have somebody that you can communicate with and who uh, who can, especially with me being a rookie there, new. It's a tough place. I mean, yeah. there's a lot of drivers that have come there uh, from all over the world and said, this place is, uh, look at Alonzo, for example. Yeah. Okay. Alonzo's a great example. He's world champion. Now, he got in the show the first time. The second time, Alonzo, uh, had, it was a rough, it was a rough ride. Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, it, it was probably with hindsight. I mean, it's the right thing to do with all those things against you. The stars not aligning, you know, walk away fine. And I don't want to give everything away from the documentary. I want people to go and watch it. So I'm going to skip forward a little bit through 1985, where you've gone back to Trans Am. Uh, with Wally, who features heavily in the uh, the documentary and seems like a good all-round guy. Um, you win the championship despite being at a disadvantage with old parts in the car. And then when the season was over, it was planned that you would test an F1 car uh, and you would go to Portugal uh, again with Bernie, hooking up with Bernie again. Tell us what it was like when you first experienced a Formula One car and how different was it from what you'd driven before? Well, I didn't win the championship in 85. I finished second. I missed winning it by 10 points. I won uh, eight races. Wally won five. Uh, but the races I didn't win, I got zero points from uh, blown engines. So, but, you know, I knew that in the whole sport knew that uh, I was the driver to beat. So at the end of the year, Don King calls me. This is the middle of the season. This is the Detroit, Detroit Grand Prix, 1985. Uh, I get a call from Don. Don says, uh, I want to meet Bernie Ecclestone. I said, okay. I said, he'll be in Detroit. He says, okay, would you, would you uh, ask Bernie if I could meet him uh, at his hotel uh, in Detroit? I said, uh, I will. So I called uh, uh, the big man and said, Don King wants to meet you. He says, no problem with him. And so uh, uh, Bernie got over here for the Grand Prix. Don flies in from New York. I'm literally in a driver's suit. I pick Don up at the airport in Detroit in my driver's suit because I'm supposed to be uh, practicing that day, right? So and, and I had a session to do. So I pick him up. We drive back to the hotel in, the, in Detroit at the Renaissance Center. I park the car right out on the curb and tell the valet, you got to take this car. I said, I, can't, I don't have time to park it. So we walk into the hotel. 
And as we're walking towards the elevator to go up to Bernie's room, Don stops at an ice cream parlor. Okay, now we're on, you know, Bernie's waiting for us, right? We're all, we're, you know, I, I'm looking at the watch. Okay, come on, let's, you know, what are we, the hell we're doing, right? And so um, Don gets two scoops of ice cream, right? He's in a suit and tie, right? Eating this ice cream. And as we get into the elevator, we go up to Bernie's room. We knock on the door and Bernie answers the door. And Bernie's not Shaquille O'Neal. Okay, Bernie's, yeah, okay, He's more like Don, King, Don King is 6'4". So we walk in and Bernie's looking up at Don and Don's licking this ice cream. So we go in and literally the first word, there was no introduction. Bernie says, they haven't even sat down. As Don's walking to sit down, Bernie says, Don, he says, well, what kind of money are you making in that boxing business? It was classic. <laughs> it was classic. And so Don, come, Don sort of paused and said, and, and said um, oh, we, we, you know, we, about this much million. How much are you making? And so Bernie says, well, I don't know if we're, we're getting that kind of numbers. They went right into talking money. It was just, uh, it was no how... How, how many kids do you have? Are you married? Right? How many you know, know. Yeah, you're right. So they sat down and, and talked about each other's business for a second. And then Don, uh, Bernie looks at Don and says, Don, what are we going to do with our boy Willie here? And so Don says, well, I want him to race Formula One and I'd like him to be a world champion. So Don, Bernie says, okay. He says, um, you know, we, we're going to, it's going to take funding for that. And when they got there, I said, okay, I looked at my watch. I had to go get in the race car. I had to go qualify. So I left the room and, 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 and the dialogue was getting heavy. It was getting, you know, I mean, it was Clydesdale, you know, you know what a Clydesdale is, right? Exactly. Big horse. It's a big horse, yeah. right? Oh. Yeah. Well, they, it, it was like, they were getting real wow. serious. So I, came back about oh an hour and a half later they were done with the meeting i knocked on the door bernie shakes don's hand walks out and so we get in the elevator and it's just me and don and don looked at me and i've never heard don say this about any man ever anybody so we're going down and everybody says he says you're uh you're a man ecclestone he's a real smart guy I never heard Bernie say, uh, Don King say anybody was smarter than himself. He he looked like he went to class. Hmm. That's what Don looked when he came out of that room with Ecclestone. It was just and I and and Bernie, you know, uh, he's my uncle. I've always called him Uncle Bernie. Uh, I'll go to I'll go to fist cuffs with anybody for him, and he knows that. And. Uh, 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 and I'm so, I'm sorry to see he's not running Formula One. I just it just doesn't seem like it. It's got the same magic. And and, and I got to tell you this: when Bernie was, I've never been invited to a Formula One race since this new group took it over. I Bernie yeah. always invited me to uh, every race that this other group they've never invited me to anything. Wow, an American group as well. Yeah, well, that's that's, a, that's a, a real a real shame. I hope that changes. Um, but Bernie, of course, was the man to put you in a Formula One car, and you tested that Formula One car. So, what was it like to pull out in a pit lane in a Formula One car compared to everything else you'd ever driven before? It must have been so amazing. It was, and um, Herbie Blash and I have been friends forever. I knew Herbie, and Herbie was running it right. Bernie wasn't there. Herbie Blash was there. Charlie Whiting was there. I knew them both. So it was from my Formula Ford days. So it was, you know, no, it was no introduction needed in, in, uh, in, that, in that department. Um, before I got in the car, Nelson P.K. comes to me and he said, really, really, so I want to talk to you. And it's a Brazilian act. I want to talk to you. So we, we go around the back of the garage. He says, 
cars very difficult. Uh, so engine, it's a lot of power. So no, no, uh, no, no in between. It's the on and off. You know, he was being very animated. It was great. He says it's a four cylinder. You know, you know, it's like a, a like some women. You know, they're very hot and cold. You <laughs> said. And oh, and typical Nelson, right? And so I, he says, just be careful. He says, you may, you know, feel, feel it, and and understand the the power. And uh, he says, this because he had just went to Williams. He had just left uh, uh, Brabham, uh, and he and and he was going to Williams team uh, with Mansell, I think, and. Um, when I got in the car, I rolled out and it was, you know, the thing was sort of, you know, uh, it, 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 one thing I learned that the faster you go with that thing, the smoother it got. You just had, you had to get through that harsh barrier, you know, get those tires warm and, 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 and get, get the chassis to work, get the aerodynamic side of it, get that thing to set down. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, but when when Charlie Whiting started turning that boost up, that BMW had some grunt. Okay, I mean it had a thousand horsepower, right? A thousand horsepower and no mid range. Either it's all on or all <laughs> off. And when it comes on, I mean I was I got on to the uh, you could when the tires were cold, you could spin them in fifth gear. <laughs> wow. You could spin them in fifth gear, and I thought, man, this is this uh, this is uh, it was amazing power. But what I the hardest thing to adapt to was how well it stopped. Mm -hmm. I could not believe anything could stop like that. And yeah, so, yeah, yeah and and I kept I, I, after my first run, uh, I got out of the car. And I went to lunch. Well, I got back, and they Patrese was testing as well, and so was DeAngelis, right? And so I'm watching. I got drove my road car down to turn one because I had to find out. I said, "Where do you put the brakes on around here?" So I went out on the road car, and I thought, "Holy shit, these cats are getting right to the corner, literally, and putting on the brakes." So I thought, "Okay, all right." Well, I'm, and so I went around different parts of the track to see what they were doing. So then I started working up to it. And when it was over, um, I went faster than May had planned on. Yeah. Over, so over a second faster. The, you clearly impressed. And then obviously you didn't end up in Formula One. Um, the line that was spun was that they wanted an Italian driver. So off you went again, um, back to the States. And I wasn't upset. I knew, and I knew Bernie, uh, I, uh, he had to have it funded. And I didn't come in with any funding from America or any other multinational con uh, country. Uh, so, uh, but I wasn't upset. And I knew Bernie, uh, if he could have done it, he would have. And it's nice that you've kept that relationship with Bernie. So obviously, you know, one of the good guys. Um, skipping forward then into, into the NASCAR days, uh, Deep South, Redneck Territory, Redneck Sport, tough, tough time, I think it's fair to say. They, they weren't ready for Willie T. Ribs down there. And the, in the South, uh, most African Americans down there were conditioned to stay in their place. You don't, you don't speak up, you, you look down, you don't look eye to eye, and and you definitely don't say nothing, all right? Well, I didn't come from there. First of all, I didn't come from uh, a a poor or I didn't come from a background where I was um, a po poverty background. No. Okay. And and you didn't have a history of saying nothing. <laughs> right. Exactly. Right. I didn't come from poverty. What and 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 unfortunately, most African Americans there came from poverty, right? Very, and I didn't. Uh, I didn't. Uh, as a matter of fact, one 
uh, mechanic. I think it was Junie Dunleavy, his old, old owner and mechanic. He was 75 years old. He says to me when I got down there, he says, Willie, you know, you got to remember that most of these drivers here and mechanics and team owners, they never, they never been around any, any colored folks in their life. And I said, yeah, I understand how they feel because nor was I. <laughs> and he, he just stared at me. I, I, I said, I grew up in San Jose, California, 0.2% black. I mean, white. I mean, yeah, 0.2% black or people of color, 0.2. And I was the only black kid in my class all through my grade years, the only one. So mm. what was I to do? How was I, I, I only know one place. Um, um, when I was down there, they, there was some, there was some uh, words said, and there were, you know, I mean, the first thing I noticed is that guys were spitting around me, spitting. It's unbelievable, isn't it? Yeah, oh. and um, they knew my reputation as a, as, a, as a fighter, so I didn't get, not one of them used the N-word to my face. I just had to walk around spit. And, uh, and, and, and there was, some of the fans weren't, were, were pretty nasty. Well, the, the thing that is, you know, worrying now is that, you know, if you look at NASCAR today and, and the news just out that they're finally, you know, banning the Confederate state flag and, and that has been met with a lot of criticism as well on social media through, through, you know, huge NASCAR fans. So there is still that, that level of, of, you know, discrimination there. How do you, how do you look at, you know, NASCAR in particular as, you know, quite a, a well-known Southern American sport as well. How do you look at it now compared to what you were dealing with then? Not much has changed. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you, and I'm going to tell you why. First of all, if George Floyd hadn't have been murdered, and he was still alive today, would those flags come down? Those flags would still be up. No one would have ever mentioned it. Mm -hmm. So that was being reactive, not proactive. Those flags should have been down 30 years ago. Okay. And I dared a lot of people, and I challenged NASCAR and some of its uh, peers if you're so uh, so um, um, strong about your beliefs in the First Amendment, then hang up the swastika, put that out in the infield, and see what happens. Mm -hmm. Huh? Yeah. You you believe in the First Amendment? Okay. Fly the fly the Nazi flag in the infield and see how that would go over. Mm -hmm. They would, they didn't know. They would never do that. Never. So, uh, it's, it's come down, but as my grandpa used to say, when a man takes off his shirt, he's still the same man. What's got to change is their heart. Not whether they take take a flag down. And right now, there's a lot of upset fans. It's I'm reading about it right now. They're mad. They're going to boycott NASCAR because their Confederate flag has. Uh, they can't fly their Confederate flag. So what's real? What's what really? Well, they can't go to any of the races anyway at the moment, so there's uh, nothing to be boycotted. Oh, well, good. But, I mean, it's, it just it just shows, though, doesn't it, that you know, like you say, Willie, um, has anything really changed? And it, it does. You know, when you put it like that, it, it does feel like very much a, a reactive process rather than proactive, as you say. And we'll talk. We'll touch on this a little bit more, I'm sure, a little later. Um, I want to skip over um, a few years. We'll let people again see, see the documentary um, to catch up on, on the mid to late 80s. I want to skip forward um, towards your, your second go at Indy. And uh, we're heading towards the 90s now. Derek Walker, 
um, comes comes around, you have a bit of budget, you can get yourself into the month of May. Tell us about this this month of May and the experience leading up to qualifying for the Indy 500 and then that incredible moment, which it really got me in the documentary when you're driving down the pit lane, you've made it through and it's that real, you're cheering and everyone's going, yes, it's amazing. And that was the moment in the documentary that made me go, oh, it's a sweet Jesus, I can't take this anymore. Talk us through that month of May. All right, we're, we're going from uh, uh, Roush and the Formula One test. We'll skip right through Gurney, my relationship with Dan Gurney, what we did from uh, 86 until 91, okay? So yep. we, uh, which in the, in the film, when people see the film, every year was something. So they're, it's gonna blow their mind. It's extraordinary. But, yeah, so um, I get a call from Bill Cosby, just like I got a call from Paul Newman. And he says, what do you want to do? And so I told him what I wanted to do. So 91, uh, Derek Walker, the Porsche IndyCar team was over. Porsche was pulling that IndyCar. Uh, Derek had actually left Penske Racing. He was running Roger Penske's team when Rick Mears was there and Bobby Unser and, and uh, Porsche hired him. Well, Porsche only stayed on for a few years and then they pulled the plug. So Derek was without a gig. So I found that out. I called Bill and I said, hey, there's a guy named Derek Walker and he's a badass and, and he could do the job for us. So he said, get him. That's all Bill said, get him, bye. He would say, he would say get him, bye, and then hang up, right? And <clears throat> so, I met Derek Walker at Sebring in February, uh, not Sebring, Daytona, the Daytona 24 hour, mm -hmm. February of 1991. And I said, um, I'd like to do, uh, discuss doing Indy 500. Bill Cosby will support it. And he wants us, meaning you and I, to fly to Las Vegas in two days to meet him. Just like that. And Walker, just sort of stared at me like a deer in headlights, like, is this real? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because I walked right up to him and we already knew each other. And I told him, I said, Bill is going to do this and he wants us in Vegas in two days. And so Walker says, okay, okay. So we met in Vegas. We went to the Bill. Bill was doing a show, I think, at the Vegas Hilton, I think at the time. And, um, we got to his dressing room right after his last show, which was, oh, about midnight, midnight. And we sit in the dressing room and Bill instantly liked Derek. And so this is what I'm gonna do. Okay, all right, well then tell me, do you think we could do a bunch of chain of repair shops too? And, and, you know, Bill went right, he, he had already, how much is going to cut? Oh, okay, no problem. And uh, I'll, I'll get you the money next week. Literally, two days after, and we didn't leave his dressing room till 3 a.m. We were in his dressing room through 3. We shook hands, uh, and Cosby said, don't talk to anybody but me. I don't want you to talk to my lawyer, my agent, or anything. I'm going to send you the money from my bank account. How many people do that? <laughs> they don't, okay? Right. Nobody does that. So um, I don't think Derek believed him. I get a call on Tuesday. This show was Sunday night. I get a call on Tuesday and it's Walker on the phone. And he says, uh, I have the money. I said, yeah, I know. That's what he said he was gonna do. He said, no one does that. <laughs> he said, no one sends the money in two days. He says, usually they get around to sending it. He said, I've never dealt with it. Cosby, despite what it, what's happened, yeah. he was the most honest man. When he said he was going to do something, he did it. And he did it right then. And usually more. So we got the money. 
we go to Indy, we, we had a car that was an old, old, old year old car and we had to, you know, dust it off and get it right. And Tim Wardra from England was my engineer. And I owe Cosby and Wardra uh, everything that happened in 91 and that put me in the Indy 500. Wardrop was just, he looked, he reminded me of Ringo Starr, the Beatles. Actually, he's a little bit more attractive. Than himself. But he had, <laughs> he, he always wore those Ringo Starr glasses, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and he had, uh, you know, sometimes he'd be smoking a cigarette. And he was very calm, William. And he had already won Indy as an engineer two times. And uh, um, yeah, with Ari Leyendijk. So, um it, it was just the best uh and we didn't have much i mean we were blowing up engines because uh, uh buick had a bunch of well for my engine they had some bad rod bolts and they were snapping and finally we got a good engine with a little pressure uh, uh on buick to uh qualify with but wardrop was just he was so smart and he was just easy to work with. And then when the day was over, you know, you could go out and party with him. I mean, Vegas, I mean, Tim Wardrop and I tore up Las Vegas many times, right? I mean, I had, uh, I had Tim partying like he's never partied before. He was, <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I got him double teamed and he wasn't Michael Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh uh he was just uh it was him and bill and john waters uh and Lori garish there were some great guys there was only a handful of us but they were all super uh talented yeah yeah mm. and a big a big underdog story because you know you you, you were uh, despite the money that you got um from uh from bill you were still on a shoestring budget i mean this was what three hundred and fifty thousand dollars, which i think they say in the documentary that you, you know you spend that before you even turn up at the track um so so to qualify it makes it even more incredible that you got through that qualified on such a shoestring budget in a one-year-old car with a with a skeleton team it must have been an unreal feeling when you pulled well, it well i mean it wasn't even a shoestring i mean this is, this was a thread <laughs> uh, and and it was that what it that made it real satisfying that made it you know to you know if you go there in roger penske's team all right well you're you, there's no mind, a whole lot of pressure yeah. you got everything on top of everything right to do it and then in those days to qualify for the indy 500 there's 75 guys showing up for 33 spots it was real hard it was hard. And, and when it was over, cause you're there for a month and when you're done, you, you, it, it changes you cause you really see, you really get a chance to look inside yourself. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's an incredible race. It's, uh, we were saying, um, we interviewed someone yesterday, well, a couple of days ago, and we were talking about Indy and I was saying the Indy 500 is probably the only indie race, um, Indy car race that I'll sit through quite happily from start to finish, watch every single lap. Even today, it's an incredible, incredible race to watch. Um, and the moment is captured brilliantly in the, in the show, the documentary. So, um, of course, we urge everyone to go and watch it, watch it through. There are some incredible, incredible moments in it. Um, and as, as Willie says, every year, there's a drama. There's a, there's a there's a comeback story. It's it's a fantastic watch. So do go and see it now, Willie. It would be a miss of us not to uh, get your take on uh, modern day motorsport. Do you still watch Formula One? Uh, are you, are you um, a fan? Because I well, I'm a friend of Lewis's. First of all, I'm 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 his supporter. I support him. I support the stand that he's taken right now. Yeah, and it's a, it's a from from a human rights position. There's not many men that do that, especially at the highest level. Why? Because they're worrying about money, what they'll lose, the, the commercial side uh, uh, of their career. And he's, 
And I was the same way. That's not what it's about. We're human beings. And, and I watched Formula One because of him. And, and, and his dad and I, Anthony, are good friends. I'm his guest when I come to, to when he comes to uh, Texas every year for the United States Grand Prix. And he's just a good kid. Okay. And he's not a kid. He's a man, but mm. he's old enough to be my son. All right. So, uh, or young enough to be my son. So uh, I, I, um, I support him and I got his back and, um, and, uh, and, and he's doing, he's doing the right thing. Absolutely. Yeah. And he even called out the other uh, F1 racing drivers actively on, on his socials saying, you're not speaking up. I can see you. I'm the only one that's talking here. I'm the only uh, person of color in the Formula One field. I shouldn't be on my own talking about this. And, and thankfully others did speak up. But then again, to hark back to what we were talking about with NASCAR and the Confederate flag, it very much seems like it's uh, yeah. responsive and a PR spin and not very much, uh, you, you know, know something who created proactive. That? Who? Lewis created all of that. Yeah. It went from Lewis to the other uh, Grand Prix drivers to NASCAR. They they all watched Lewis. So they j all jumped on Lewis's bandwagon. Mm. It started with Lewis and then it went to NASCAR. So I'm there Lewis gets the credit for that. And he's taken a lot of heat over it. But I got I, look, you know, um, Bernie supports him. Right. Ross Braun has come out and actively said Formula One is fully behind him as well. I love Ross Braun. I've known him forever. And there's a few men that I'll go to blows for in a pub. Ross Braun's one. Mm. But I suppose the question is, it is great that all this is happening, that, you know, changes are being made, whether they're responsive or not, perhaps. But I suppose the question is, how do we... How do, how do we keep this going? Because is there a danger that it's just going to, once the season starts, it's just going to fall off, fall off the face of the earth and people go back to normal again? It doesn't seem like that in terms of the atmosphere, but you know, we have had things like this before where the Black Lives Matter movement has been at the forefront of um, certainly the UK tabloids, but then, it's, then, it, then it falls away again. How do we make sure, you know, particularly in motorsport, it, it stays as an issue that we try and solve? Is that question even answerable? Well, you can't. Once that momentum starts, mm. and the momentum has started, you have to keep the momentum going. Okay, Ross has already uh, stepped up and says, okay, we are going to continue. And let's face it, Formula One is the NFL of auto racing. It is the big league. There's not, NASCAR is not close to uh, Formula One in terms of magnet, nor is IndyCar. Formula One is on another planet. And they just so happen to have a driver of color that is a world champion, one of the greatest ever to walk the planet, right? Yeah. Formula One can, can and all because of Ron Dennis. Ron Dennis was, uh, is, is the diversity king for Formula One. He groomed uh, Lewis Hamilton. Ron Dennis should uh, be knighted for that. I mean, he should be bowing in front of the queen for that. And so should Lewis. They should be side by side. If I was the queen, I'd march Ron and Lewis and Bernie, all three of them in. Mm. Well, there is, a huge, there is a huge debate every year that Lewis Hamilton hasn't been honoured uh, by the Queen every year. You know, other sportsmen and athletes get honoured and yet he is always overlooked. And it bring, before, in years gone by, the question has never been, a, the, you know, of race has never quite come up properly. It's always something that people have tended to skip over. But I think that yeah. is now a question that people ask, you know, is that, is, is, is that racism inherent that we are just, you know, he's not being honoured because of the colour of his skin, yet he is the you know, he's probably the greatest motorsport driver uh, to ever and live. History. And, yeah. and, and history, right. Yeah. And um, it, it does feel like that this time around, because these things come and go, don't they? You know, there'll be something that, that brings race into the public eye for a while, then it dies, then it comes back. And this one feels like for, in my lifetime anyway, the first time that I've experienced 
such conversation around it. Like all my friends are talking about it. Um, everyone on the news is talking about it. And it's the first time I feel like people are sort of looking inside themselves and really thinking about the way they perceive things and not just going, oh, I'm, I'm not racist, it's fine, yeah, what are you talking about? They're actually going deep inside themselves and taking, a, taking the time to think, actually, hang on a minute, how, how do I react to race? And that sort of feels like a bit of a sea change to me. And it's never, I've never felt it like it is now. And I don't know whether it's the same feeling you're getting over in the States, but certainly over here, that's the feeling I get. People are really searching within themselves this time. Well, and that's the only way it's going to go. Uh, uh, continue. The, it's, it's momentum, okay? People are seeing it now. The whole world is seeing it. We, uh, communication has never been bigger and better worldwide than it is now. We all know what to do. It's really not rocket science. And just do it, okay? There's been, in, there's been inequities over a hundred years. Uh, hundreds of years okay let's make the, uh, adjustments to those inequities and not be afraid to make a change mm -hmm. and and you've got to you've got and the young kids young men young men your age i mean you you young you guys are young you, well he's young harry's young um, me not so much well <clears throat> when you get 65 uh like willie t you'll <clears throat> you'll say it and uh, uh, it's 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 your uh, it, it's your turn. It's you you it's your turn. It's your generation's turn to run the ball or drive the car. And I uh, you know there it's great because there are older generations like say Ron Dennis, all right, and like Bernie and like Ross Braun that see it. They know it's got to be done. All right, and they're going to endorse it. Yeah, I, and I think as well the timing of of Uppity, it, it couldn't have come at a better time, almost as well. So hopefully that plus the amount of the amount of influential sportsmen, not just Lewis Hamilton, but people across the across the board in sports as well, uh, and in every other aspect of life, uh, that exactly as you say momentum is so important um it feels almost a bit uh, a bit weird then cutting to a different type of subject but on on the subject line of modern day motorsports and and uh things you watch and enjoy and actively listen to do you know much about formula e that's a new championship and all electric what do you think of this sort of new modern day technology world of racing you know when i first heard about it, i thought it was the, the name of a vibrator. <laughs> no, I, no, literally. For me, I, and and because um. and, I thought, okay, no, they, they couldn't be serious, right? Thank you. And, and, uh, round of applause. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, sound is everything, okay, gentlemen? I, I, and I'm going to be uh, really graphic, okay? I, when Bernie Eccles... We're not talking about the vibrator anymore, are we? we no, we, no, we not the vibrator, but, but I got to <laughs> tell you, you know, uh, I was asked a long time ago, um, what did I do as a hobby? Well, I shoot. I, my, my son, Theo's one of the top shooters in the world. Comes to England every year and shoots with George Digweed, who is the greatest shooter in the planet, and he's from England. And so... Um, they asked me, my, why didn't I like golf? I said, well, it was too quiet. I said, I like anything that makes noise. Mm. That could be a race car. That could be a shotgun. <laughs> that could be a woman. Okay, it's got to make noise, all right? <laughs> okay, that, that, they got to put some sound to that electric car. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I've been saying this. Okay, right, right, because, you know, um, you people like, and there's been complaints that Formula One cars today are not loud enough, mm. right? So now we're going to get out there with the sewing machine. You know, I, you know, I know it's, you know, it's clean, and you know, it, it, you know, you, you don't have to hold, you know, worry about your eyes burning or, or the smell. But it's just, we got to do something about the sound. Yeah, yeah. I'm totally, <laughs> totally with you. 
I, 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 we're on the fence. We don't know if we like it or not. Well, Harry, yeah, I think you I, like I've, I have worked in Formula E, and I admit the sound is 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 a weird thing to comprehend at first. It's also a bit dangerous as well. If you're working in the pit lane yeah. and you can't they hear a coming. car about to come out of a garage, you can you can have a, a serious injury. I they do they do have like a sound. Star Wars, Star Wars. They do have a sound. The sound it's just different. <laughs> like a, yeah, it sounds uh, like a sawing machine, and hmm. I was. You know, my my wife, um, she was actually sewing, and she doesn't sew very often, but she was sewing, and I heard it, and I thought, damn, I said that's formal E right there, <laughs> and and I thought, that was the, that was a very actually that was a spot on impression. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, okay, um, it's just not going to draw a, a big crowd, mm. you know. Now, if you watch tv and and i and i've watched races with the sound off before imagine you know watching yeah. a race with the sound off on tv mm. weird yeah yeah that's not the same yeah okay question for you what what sound would you give a formula e car like the old v12s v10 mm. yeah they, 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 we, we can't put a turbo on them and get that popping sound, but we could get that V12, V10 sound. Yeah, I think you need to uh, you need to get in touch with them and, and get forward your ideas. I think you need to be on the board for Formula E. Yeah, yeah. Um, what about, you know, you mentioned you, you, your son is one of, one of the top shooters. Were there never, was there any interest in getting your kids involved in motorsport? You know, motorsports become so difficult for a young young man now. Back in the days when I was racing, there was lots of Andrettis. There was lots of Unsers. Uh, you know, the, even Formula One, you had Villeneuve, Villeneuve, and, and then you had Graham Hill and Damon Hill. And okay. Damon and I are really good friends, right? Um, you don't see it anymore because mm. the difficulty of bringing them up, bringing them up the ladder and the cost. And, you know, I, shooting was my hobby, clay shooting. And Theo went out with me as a kid and pushed the buttons. And then as soon as he was big enough to hold a shotgun in his shoulder, he started shooting. And he, he got, you know, and shooting is like golf. It's very technical, right? Especially pro shooters, right? And he picked it up right away and he made a career out of it. And he's, you know, traveling, getting paid and he's traveling around the world. And that was the reason I came back to England a few years ago in the first place. Yeah. Because he was shooting at EJ Churchill in the World Championship. At, Amazing. Uh, in High Wycombe. And, and to, as you say, to get paid for doing a sport you love and you're good at, that must make all the difference when you see so many young motorsport you know, drivers coming up through the field and they're, you know, they're paying to be there. They're not making a single cent. I think I even saw a news story, although I take it with a bit pinch of salt, but Jean Alessi, his he had to sell one of his old Ferrari F1 yeah, cars to that. fund yeah. his son's Formula 2 campaign. And you just think, well, if you think for a start, you're lucky to have a Formula 1 car to sell. But also, second off, the fact that he's having to do that is just, you know, it just shows the system is completely flawed. Yep, yep, it's yeah. changed. It's, mm. it's changed uh, dramatically. Mm. And, um, you know, it, but um, we'll see. We'll see with everything that's happened with this pandemic, if there's yes. going to be an adjustment, if there's going to be an adjustment in the sport. Mm. There's, I mean, there, there already is on, you know, in the calendar front and more packed races, reverse grids, perhaps in Formula One as well. So I think everything's up, up for, up for grabs these days. Um, we've got um, there's there's a there's a couple of questions. Well, there's actually three questions that we usually ask um, our guests at the end of a podcast. This this is part of our new series, um, shining a light on on certain individuals in the sport. And we weren't actually going to ask these questions, but Harry, I think we should ask two of them, if you're yeah. cool with that. Um, I, th I think we should ask, um, first of all, what's got you excited at the moment? What are you excited about? What's happening in, in your life that's got you pumped? Well, we, you know, the, the film is done, Uppity, and uh, a, a great producer saw it by the name of Brian Koppelman, and he, sh he, he does the show Billions on Showtime. Yes. For he saw Uppity, and he's doing a pilot right now for a four-year series. 
spinoff uppity. Wow. The nice. producer will be Don Cheadle. That's so exciting. That's, that's in the works right now. That, that is, is exciting. Very exciting. Wow. That's going to be a, oh, I can't wait to see that when that and, comes out. And, 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 you know, the, the, the doc, the doc is straight business. Four years, eight episodes a season. You know, it's going to be some salacious stuff in there. I mean, there's the real, I mean, the behind the scenes, the words that were used, what? the things that happened, the parties, James Hunt, for example. I oh, mean, brilliant. You know, and, and James Hunt was one of my heroes. I mean, the cat was just all, he was, he, he just had personality. Mm. And, and uh, he was dancing on a table in Las Vegas one night. Uh, it was a Paul Ankles, I think it was a, when they were doing the Formula One race in day. It might have been 83 or 84, and, no, 82, 81 or 82. I'm dancing and I see Hunt up on the table. He'd already retired. He was up on the table dancing in the disco, in the nightclub. And a guy named Hogan, he ran Marlboro, uh, Marlboro, uh, England, right? John Hogan, that was his name. They were both on the table dancing. Hogan had his shirt on. So you're going to, the, the scenes, the scenes for uh, the, the show, the series, it's going to be. So I'm assuming someone's going to be playing you. Do you get a say in who that is? They're going to, where are they going to have a list for me? That's exciting. So cool. And we had, we had James Hunt's son, Freddie Hunt, on the show a few weeks back, and he is the spitting image. And it, we actually, we accidentally, Tim accidentally called him James because he's just, he's the same kind of mannerisms and the way he talks and his outlook on life. It's just, it's just incredible. Very different character though. Yeah. Very different character. Um, I'm assuming the final question is, is the last one that you want to ask. Yep. So, uh, Woody T. Ribs, uh, we, we asked this to, to all of our guests. What are you scared of? I would say not succeeding. Right. But, you know, I've, I've never been afraid of uh, death. I would, I would definitely in the wrong profession for that. Right. So I never worried about that. Um, but not accomplishing goals that, that I set for me. Yeah. That would, yeah. yeah. I think that's, um, that's a, great that is a brilliant way to end the show. Willie Tiris, we could talk to you for hours. I think your yeah. story is incredible. Uh, we've touched on a few things there, but of course uh, they're all uh, that and more is all in the, in the documentary Upper Tea, which is on Netflix. You can also uh, uh, buy the DVD and have a, a search it online. It's everywhere. The Willie T. Ribs story. It is fascinating. Willie, thank you so much for coming on the Motormouth podcast. We're going to do it again, babe. Absolutely. Yeah, we are. Thanks,